Ah, rip off exploitation. How I've missed you so. Not since Deadly Prey and Hands of Steel has such a delicious knockoff sandwich been prepared to share with you lovely little sleaze fiends that can't seem to get enough of this stuff. Though some of you just can't seem to get enough of me. But hey, that's cool too. For those that missed my Demons review, or you've just kinda stumbled on this video after tripping into the weird no-name section of YouTube and are still watching this for some reason, I gushed about a certain Lamberto Bava film which to me is one of the best examples of how to take plot elements from popular films and blend them into perfect exploitation bliss. Take a nice big serving of first blood, grate a healthy amount of deliverance on top, and you've got yourself a blast fighter. We begin with our lead big-ass motherfucker, Mike Tiger Sharp. Yes, his middle name is actually Tiger. Would I really fuck with you? An ex-cop released from prison after serving an eight-year sentence, and not even a minute after walking introspectively, Mike is picked up by his friend who promptly arms him to the teeth, giving him the most highly advanced gun of all time. They'll fire grenades, tear gas, explosives, you name it, and a scope is light intensification capabilities in infrared. Well, it's a tactical shotgun with a scope on it, but for cinematic standards, that's pretty high tech. He wanted the gun to take out some corporate Dick Jones that was responsible for his wife and partner's death and for putting him away for eight years. Mike decides that it isn't worth killing the guy, so he drives back to his old town out in the boonies to live a quiet life with the possession of the most brutal gun in the fucking world. Moving back into his old family home, Tiger tries to rekindle his passion for hunting, so he takes the Blast Fighter out for a whirl, but it appears that his old trigger finger isn't as itchy as it used to be. When some poachers gun the deer down, Tiger flashes back to his days as a beat cop. Finish him off, he's suffering. We want him alive. Now fuck off. Shit. That there's a gun and a half. Where'd you get it? You want to sell it? The one you got's already too big for you. He decides to take a baby fawn home with him to protect it from the big bad poachers. Blast fighter! Got a baby bottle? What do you want with a baby bottle? Just like to drink out of it. Sorry, I asked. Obviously, he's buying it for Bambi, but if you take that scene out of context, it's fucking hilarious. Ooh, I gotta buy me a flying jacket so I can walk tall and be a real dude. <laughs> After getting hassled by douchebags the same way that I do for wearing an M65 Vietnam field jacket, Mike buys some milk for his new little buddy. What's it gonna do? What the fuck? You goddamn son of a bitch! Who the hell do you think you- You wanna know who I am? I'm a son of a bitch! Who wants to be left alone? Ride the tiger! You can see his stripes, but you know he's clean! Tiger goes to the sheriff's office to pay for the damage done to the store and bumps into his old buddy George Eastman. Hi, Tig. I'm sorry for what they did. You can't fool me, movie. I know what George Eastman really sounds like. Raul Morales is the strongest. This is Tom. He and Tiger were best buds when Tiger went off into the city to become super cop. While Tig was gone, Tom became king of the poachers. He has his brother working for him the John Kreese looking motherfucker that shot the deer, and some creep that's worth several million dollars and pays hand over fist just for the antlers. He wants the animals alive to sell to his friends to make into medicine and aphrodisiacs. Just all around sketchy scumbag behavior on all fronts. I've been a hunter all my life, but never a butcher. 
Tiger takes matters into his own hands, going after Tom's prized poacher and tries to run roughshod on the base of operations. Things don't go so well, and Eastman steps in to stop it all. Tom makes it clear that if Tiger wants to go to war, he'll be on his brother's side. Mike isn't entirely sure how to react to arriving home to see a random cute girl doing his housework. Well, he has been in prison for eight years. I'm sure he isn't quite used to someone being his bitch for a change. Then I'll kick your ass out of here. If you even touch me, I'll split your head open. Now quit acting like a fired horse's ass! Hence why he's sleeping outside. Tiger realizes that this is a really lousy idea, so he goes back into his own house again to banter with the strange woman that has forced her way into living with him. The next morning, Tiger decides to drag the possibly insane young woman into the car and drive her back into town. But the brakes on his car were cut, off screen. The poachers spot the smoke from the explosion, so they drive into the woods hoping to pick Tiger's bones clean. Well, at least they're referring to him as what he wants to be called. I'm a son of a bitch! Who wants to be left alone. Oh hell, you don't understand a frigging thing, do you? Oh yeah? I understand you're a real ball breaker. That's right! I got it from you! From that brilliant exchange of dialogue, we learn that her name is Connie and she's Tiger's daughter. Connie went looking for him because the last time she saw him, she was eight years old and he didn't even so much as shoot her a phone call when he got out of prison. Look, kid, you gotta understand. I'm a son of a bitch who wants to be left alone. Exactly. His daughter starts nagging about him abandoning her and Tiger draws back to another haunted memory of his past, the murder of his wife and the revenge that he took in her name. Admittedly, it's a pretty powerful scene, but I do wish they would have splurged a little more on that gunshot to the head. I mean, it would have looked so much better if it was something like this. Tiger's buddy and Connie's very sharply dressed friend Pete decide to show up for a surprise visit. Tiger, of course, is not pleased. I'm a son of a bitch! Wants to be left alone. Connie gets super sentimental with Tig, and there's some dialogue I'm sure they meant to be heartfelt and genuine, but it comes off as so fucking funny and unrealistic. I only appear to be a strong woman. I never had anyone to confide in. Someone that I could reach out to. Well, now I'm reaching out to you. I'm sorry, but wow. Is there a single solitary woman out there that would admit to such a thing? Oh, I of course mean that would say such horse shit. <sighs> Almost came off like a chauvinistic pig there. <laughs> After that touching moment, the poachers launch a flaming barrel attack on Mike's home, turning the rest of the film into a First Blood style fight for survival. Things take a turn for the worst into deliverance territory as Connie is savagely raped by the poachers. What? You're not actually expecting me to make a joke, are you? Their ride is totaled, and the poachers are on hot pursuit. But at least Connie and Tiger are bonding. Where's the girl that said she was so strong? Where's your balls, Connie? What did you say? I said we gotta get going. You call me Connie. I think by now, we all know what relevance scenes like this have in revenge flicks. Got to pull the bone apart before I put the splint on. You think you can handle it? I got your blood in me. So she has tiger blood? Oh fuck, did I really just make that reference? Ty, listen! Let's call it an accident! Forget it! Tiger agrees to give up and call it a day, but Tom's shit dick brother decides to open fire and Connie is no more. Which, even when you know it's coming, it's pretty goddamn sad. Which makes it all the more satisfying when Tiger goes full Rambo on these motherfuckers. The final action sequence of the film is excellent. There are plenty of cool throwbacks to First Blood, from Tiger taking on a helicopter from a cliff and getting decked out with a huge gun and bandoliers. We get to see the full potential of his super gun as he brutally annihilates the poachers left and right, 
earning the film its title of Blast Fighter. And of course, the highlight of this film is the standoff between Eastman and Sopke. To keep the review going at a brisk pace, I had to save a lot of the real backstory between Tiger and Tom for the end. In the scene where Tiger goes to fetch a car from town, he gets to talking with Tom and they reminisce about how they used to compete against each other, and it left Tom with a permanently busted leg. This gives their showdown an incredibly epic feel, because you know that the movie has been building up to this since the second that Tiger set foot back into town. They have an old-fashioned draw, and Tiger proves that he's still the better man between the two, taking out Tom's other leg. And then a surprising twist, Tiger doesn't finish him off, but rather drives his old friend back into town, and it's just another chapter in their competitive friendship. That's the interesting part about Eastman's character in this. He's not technically a villain, he's just kind of stuck in the middle of Tiger's thirst for vengeance and defending his brother's honor, even if he is involved in some really sketchy shit. I've always thought that Blast Fighter had a really solid plot for an exploitation film. It's a little bit scattered here and there with Tiger's backstory, but I dig this idea that he's just trying to let go of his anger and live his life in peace, but he keeps being called back behind the gun. The movie was originally going to be sci-fi, but complications in production forced that idea to be shit-canned and the writer was commissioned to write a new script. Since the film had already been promoted under the title Blast Fighter, it was kept the same. You could say that there are maybe too few many subplots, like Tiger's long-lost daughter and his competitive backstory with Eastman's character, but I honestly loved both of their characters. Valentina Forte, who wasn't in too many other movies, was very sympathetic as Tiger's daughter, and I admit to getting pretty sad when her character died. George Eastman was awesome in his role. I really dig how he was conflicted and just seemed to want what's best for everyone. He wanted Tiger to be left in peace and didn't want his brother fucking around and giving Tiger a hard time. And naturally, Michael Sopke knocks it out of the fucking park yet again. With a name like Tiger Sharp in a movie called Blast Fighter, this is another one to add to the big ass motherfucker Hall of Fame. 